damn late. I had to stop by the wax museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing they army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing Ted Postal. He is Professor Emeritus of Science, Technology, and International Security at MIT. And uh, you guys, I know, on this show and around these environs are familiar with his great work debunking the lies about the Gouda Attack 13, the Kanshi Kun Attack 17, and half of the uh, Duma Attack uh, 2018. And we got some missile technology stuff to talk about and treaties and all kinds of things today. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you doing? Uh, fine, fine. Just got back from Germany, finishing a cold. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> Germany sounds fun. Sorry about the cold. What was going on in Germany? Oh, I just gave some talks, uh, German Physical Society, and then uh, some talks in, uh, in, uh, to, that were attended the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, parliamentarians. I see. People are concerned about the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, so, mm -hmm. and of course the Germans are a major uh, uh, recipient of the problems that will be created, so. Good times. All right, well, I'm going to ruin the segue, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute, because you wrote this very sure. important thing for the New York Times I want to talk about, the whole INF, and we can get back to the Germans and every bit of that. But... I was incredibly intrigued and impressed and interested when I read this long-form piece at The Intercept um, about the Duma chemical attack. It's by a reporter named James Harkin, and this is the one people, well, it's one, it's actually two. Uh, this is uh, where uh, the accusation was chlorine and sarin, and there were two different scenes, including the people saw the video of the children at the hospital being hosed down and given kind of asthma inhaler uh, breaths and stuff like this and, and supposed chemical attack there. And what I read in this article that was so interesting was that there you were in complete agreement with Brown Moses and the guys over at Bellingcat uh, who said that Part of that story was correct, not the scene at the hospital. Robert Fisk got that right. That was suffocation from dust, from bombing, from conventional attacks. It had nothing to do with a chemical attack. However, the chlorine, and there was no sarin, but the chlorine attack at the apartment building that did, in fact, kill all these people, that you agreed with him about what had happened there. So he must have got it right, because I know that uh, you guys have a history of not seeing eye to eye specifically on Syrian chemical attacks well, I, in the I, past. Well, I didn't agree with him because I had no idea what he was saying. I was asked about this. Right. I guess Arkin, that's a much better way to I put it. I provided Arkin with an analysis. Right. Y'all's analysis uh, apparently was exactly the same on this, I, is a better way to put it. Because, um, yes, I didn't mean to I'm say you were sure assenting to his that. view I'm, necessarily. I would not say that because uh, I produced an analysis. I'm not aware of what they were talking about, but uh, my analysis was simply done in response to a question that I received and information I received. I have no idea what uh, Mr. Higgins said and how he arrived at a conclusion. Okay. A uh, very important point there. Um, well, well, according it, it to Harkin, anyway, according to the Harkin piece, uh, y'all's analysis was the same. So did you want to tell us a little bit about what you found there? Yeah. Well, I, I'm surprised that the analysis was was the same because uh, Harkin was completely unaware of the issues that I raised when he, uh, when he asked me the question. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I just find it very curious that... Uh, 
uh, that uh, he would uh, he would call this a similar analysis. The conclusions may be the same, but it's not clear that there's any uh, sub that the analysis uh, is the same. Basically, what happened is uh, Mr. Harkin uh, asked me uh, about the chlorine uh, attack, and I, I had not looked at that. This was not an issue I was uh, focused on. And um, he provided me with some uh, information that allowed me to uh, to look at the physical circumstances associated with a particular attack. And I looked at it, and when I uh, saw the uh, circumstances, uh, I realized that uh, the um, there were canisters of um, chlorine dropped on this building. And in particular, there was a canister that um, fell uh, head first. By head first, I mean the canister was uh, had a... Uh, a valve on it at the top of the canister, and the um, top of the canister hit the building first. And due to an unfortunate accident of circumstances, it penetrated the roof. So it was sort of like a um, um, uh, a needle, uh, it, you know, uh, that delivers. Um, uh, you know, fluid into your body, penetrating through your skin. So the, the the top of this canister was penetrated uh, into the roof of the building, and uh, there was information that uh, Harkin provided me with about the interior characteristics of the building, and that allowed me to make a, a, a an assessment of how much um, chlorine and how quickly the chlorine would have gone into that uh, building, uh, the upper floor of the building. And um, it immediately became clear that the concentration of chlorine at the upper floor of the building was so high that if anybody simply opened the door and encountered the room where it first came in, they would simply go unconscious almost instantly because the levels were so high that uh, it would it would just simply overwhelm uh, the, an individual's uh, uh, systems, and uh, you just simply uh, hit it and collapse, uh, which is a you know very unusual situation that the chlorine density would be so high. And uh, it's also clear that the chlorine is um, significantly heavier than air. So um, it was clear that the chlorine came into the building at a very high level. It was then uh, simply settling down through the stairwells to lower levels. And uh, the concentration, if it was roughly uniform throughout the building, would have been so high that uh, people would have uh, really suffocated very, very quickly. The levels of concentration were many times above uh, what would be a lethal concentration. So uh, people would have uh, really, uh, in tens of seconds in that environment, would have uh, would have probably gone unconscious. Mm -hmm. So um, I speculated, and it is a speculation, but I think it's a reasonably informed one, that um, the chlorine came in so fast that people who might otherwise have just run away in panic uh, were exposed at levels that just caused them to be incapacitated, and they were uh, essentially killed. And uh, the, uh, there was another factor that I guessed about, but I don't know it's correct, but uh, I do know that people were widely instructed, uh, properly so, actually, to uh, go up to uh, higher floors and buildings when a chlorine attack was going on because most of the time the chlorine would be chlorine uh, containers would be opened in uh, in open areas and so the chlorine would sort of uh, it's a heavier than air so it would sort of uh, creep along the streets like a low fog and if you were in an area where you had all this chlorine the uh, best way to uh, get away from it is to go up to a high floor in the building, because the, the chlorine would mostly be settled near the ground. And um, 
what may have happened, and it sounds quite plausible, is the people in the panic in the building just followed those instructions and they ran right up into the jaws of this even more concentrated chlorine and just collapsed and died. That's that's a, a pure guess. Uh, so, um, but it's based on uh, an analysis. It's not based on um, you know. Uh, claims that have no scientific basis sorry hang on just one second hey everybody buy my book fool's errand time to end the war in afghanistan and uh, it's available all over the place in epub format and of course in paperback and kindle at amazon.com and you can also get the audiobook version at audible.com uh, if you want a signed copy uh, check out scotthorton.org slash donate and uh, help arrange that for you there. It's Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. Find out all about it at foolserrand.us. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense then about the casualties there. And I think there were people in a basement as well, right? Um, I don't know all the details of the situation. I didn't, uh, you know, uh, I was asked about, was it plausible that right. the chlorine could have killed people? Right. And after looking at it... Um, it was clear to me that it, in this particular situation, it could have. I had already told Harkin that uh, the chlorine, from from what, what I, my um, analysis of chlorine attacks, I wouldn't even call it analysis of chlorine attacks, was that although chlorine is extremely toxic, uh, it's not, uh, if, if, if it hits the ground and chlorine starts, uh, 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 Coming out of a uh, of a bottle, of, uh, you know, one of these pressurized bottles, it's going to form a plume, and it's going to be a visible plume, and uh, people are going to be able, in general, to get out of the way of the plume. They'll be frightened. It's really a, a, a mostly a weapon of terror. It's a weapon that's designed to scare the living daylights out of a population and cause them to leave. I'm not trying to suggest that this is uh, uh, more moral than killing them. I'm just saying that that I think that's probably the objective of dropping these uh, chlorine containers rather than just killing people. And, uh, of course, you can smell chlorine at a very long range. For example, you can easily smell remnants of chlorine at a kilometer or two range. It's now, a very distinctive range, smell, no doubt about that. It's not going to be concentration mm -hmm. okay. uh, to kill you. So but it's going to scare you because if you're worried about nerve agent attacks, which have nothing to do with chlorine, but if you're worried about that, uh, then you're going to be scared into thinking maybe something else is going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, I don't want to sound like I'm in any way of think this is a moral thing to do, but if you're trying to just scare the hell out of people, and getting them, you're causing them to run away from an area that you want uh, vacated. Uh, it's it's a tool that you would you would have, and that's the way it looks to me. In the in the case of uh, what the Syrians were doing, mm -hmm. now this doesn't make it moral. I mean, no, we understand uh, what you're saying is descriptive yeah. and not normative. Here, you're just. Yeah. Right, um, and now, so let me recap here just a little bit to make sure I understand here. Um, in almost any other circumstance, a chlorine bomb, like you're saying, it would be uh, dangerous but not lethal. It would be good for chasing people uh, out of an area, that it's kind of a people, thing. Yeah, Except right. in this circumstance, it happened to, you made the needle analogy, it happened to puncture the roof of this building and this upper room and floor in a way where it created a very dense cloud in this building right. that then went essentially down the stairs and hit everybody, um, you know, lower than that, essentially in that building and killed all those people. So that makes a lot of sense, helps explain what went on there. And, and, it, and it, it even explains why people may have made an honest mistake in thinking it must have been sarin since chlorine doesn't usually kill, uh, um, in that kind of a manner. Um, I don't know about that well, part. No, nobody but. knowledgeable who was an analyst would have uh, uh, would have suggested sarin. I mean, I know there was a lot of this discussion, but All right. I uh, mean, I know sarin, the inspectors said they found no evidence of that whatsoever. Later, well, but, uh, sarin is a very uh, is a very fragile molecule, and it disintegrates very easily. And chlorine would just remove the sarin very quickly. So, 
And it, it's just nobody who knew who knew what they were doing. Uh, again, ethics and morals apart, mm-hmm. would would use them in combination. It's much more effective to use a nerve agent if you if you're aiming at killing people. Nerve agent is a and you have it. Nerve agent is a much better choice. It's odorless, and uh, people will just simply and the, the level of toxicity is enormously higher than chlorine. So uh, you can get you can get people you can uh, kill people very fast and effectively with nerve agent if you have access to it and that's your objective. Chlorine is just uh, it just makes no sense to use it if that if your objective is to kill people. Mm-hmm. And now in this case, what's your level of certainty that it would have been Assad's forces to drop these chlorine bombs in the first place here? Well, I don't know anybody else who would have been in a position to drop chlorine bottles. I mean, uh, it seems to me pretty clear that the Syrians were dropping, the Syrian helicopters were dropping uh, chlorine uh, containers. So I don't... Uh, I wouldn't even begin to think of an alternative at this point because who else has helicopters to drop these things from in that area? Right. So I think it's pretty clear that uh, this was an act of the Syrian government. So uh, at least I, I, I just don't know who else could have done it. I think there's an issue with sarin because in spite of claims to the contrary, uh, there is very substantial reason to believe that some rebel forces have access to sarin. And um, so when you talk about a sarin attack, unless you you have clear and unambiguous evidence that it was dropped uh, from a, uh, a Syrian aircraft, which so far the one case we looked at in Khan Sheikhoun uh, turned out to be uh, just manufactured, um, Unless you have clear evidence that it was released uh, by the Syrian government, uh, then it's hard to know who actually did it. And there is an incentive to uh, kill people, even your own people, uh, with sarin, if you have it, and then blame it on the Syrian government because you want the uh, United States to, uh, to attack the, uh, the Syrian government as it did, and as it almost did after, after the Gauda attack. So um, now I don't. I, I want to be clear that I'm. I have no. It's not. Un, it, it, I'm not saying it's unambiguous that uh, rebels uh, use sarin against their own people. Uh, I'm simply saying that uh, when you look at the evidence, you cannot rule this out as a significant uh, explanation. And um, uh, I don't believe. Uh, sarin uh, that was used um, could have been Syrian-produced sarin because we know exactly what the Syrian-produced sarin looks like. And if there was such evidence, I think the U.N. and the United States government would have had to put it forward. And they haven't been able to. There's just been circumspect claims made by people who uh, who don't have access to the actual uh, data. So, Well, and so do you want to go ahead and comment on Khan Shikun 2017 as well? Well, I think in Khan Shikun, we, we now uh, have a, uh, I think, a pretty, a pretty clear understanding of, um, of what didn't happen there. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Um, There are reports that I believe are are probably correct, but we can get to that later. But what what the analysis done by uh, me and then later six other uh, members of a scientific group we formed, so we have seven people now, um, uh, clearly indicates that the crater at Khan Sheikhoun was produced by... um, an artillery rocket, uh, uh, and we, we, we're very sure it was an improvised artillery rocket. And the reason uh, we are sure it's an improvised, well, first of all, we know it's an artillery rocket because the shape of the crater is absolutely characteristic of, uh, of, an, of a crater produced by an artillery rocket or, uh, or an artillery shell. 
Uh, you can find, uh, we actually discovered this after we did supercomputer calculations to determine how the crater was formed. So we, we postulated, among several things, a, uh, uh, an artillery rocket landing um, and detonating at that location. Because the explosive in the rocket um, a warhead is long and narrow, you know, the warhead is, uh, is you know, maybe um, uh, 25, 30, or 40 centimeters long. Uh, the, the front end of the, uh, of the warhead is close to the ground, and the back end of the warhead is maybe at a 45 degree off the ground along a line. And this causes a somewhat tear-shaped crater to be formed. And in fact... We discovered, after we discovered this in our own independent calculations, we found artillery manu manuals for artillery officers that said, oh, if you find craters like this, you can use the shape of the crater to, um, uh, to find the direction from which the artillery was firing. And this is an o before people had what are called firefinding radars, which is a fairly recent development. Artillery officers would go out and look at these craters, and they would use the shape of the crater to estimate uh, where uh, the artillery was firing from, the direction. And if you had several craters where you got the direction, you could cross-fix and get a rough estimate of the location of the artillery unit or, or the rocket firing unit. Now, um, if you look at video data from the Kanche Kun scene, we actually see two other uh, craters for, of the same size as the one that was supposedly the location for the siren release, right along the direction of the um, uh, that you would have predicted from this first crater. So there are three craters all in a line. Well, that certainly is compatible uh, with uh, with a crater. Uh, produced by an art, an artillery rocket uh, explosion. Then, um, if you look at the crater itself, you expect to find uh, certain um, markings in the ground from the um, fragments from the warhead. A warhead, um, a standard artillery piece or, or, or rocket uh, artillery warhead, has metal around it, which is intentionally designed to fragment and create a spray of metal fragments that are extremely lethal. And in the case of a, um, it's very hard to get the casing of, of, of the metal casing to fragment into many small fragments. You need to really have very uh, highly controlled metallurgical procedures to create a casing that will fragment into many small pieces. If you don't have this highly controlled metallurgical process, you get fragments that tend to be large, much larger, and you get many fewer fragments. It's much less lethal. And we see evidence for that, that indicating that the, the warhead casing was made out of a non-specialized metal that would cause... Uh, very large uh, amounts of fragments uh, that would be produced by an actual warhead that was, uh, you know, sold maybe by uh, Bulgarians or Romanian uh, or even Russian uh, arms manufacturers. So uh, we can we can see that the shape of the crater and the markings from fragments indicate that the warhead uh, was uh, was a, uh, a warhead that was manufactured locally. It was an indigenous warhead. And then the motor, rocket motor casing is split, uh, indicating that the rocket motor casing was produced out of a, of a regular pipe. Pipe is most pipe that is used in uh, in, in most applications is a, is a strip is manufactured from a strip of metal that is rolled into a pipe and then welded. Um, specialized pipe, uh, which has no welds in it, is forced through a, um, uh, uh, a cylindrical seam-like uh, 
um, uh, structure. So it, it, it's formed in the, it, it, as a pipe that has no welds in it at all mm-hmm. by, by forcing it through this, um, this special uh, press. Now, that is a very expensive process relative to just uh, the, the alternative manufacturing technique. But what it allows you to do is, is make a pipe that has a much thinner wall and is much stronger. And for purposes of a military, and for military applications, you want to uh, have a thinner pipe for the um, rocket motor. So the rocket motor weighs less, has more propellant in it, more propellant weight in it. And, and so uh, you would not get a split casing like we see. So we know that the, uh, that the rocket motor from this artillery rocket, which is what we see lying in the ground, is, uh, is, uh, is manufactured from is an indigenous manufactured rocket motor. And the twist in the rocket motor is from the fact that the, um, the initial explosion of the, of the warhead digs a hole in the ground very quickly, which the rocket motor casing follows into the crater. And the, and the front end of the casing gets caught in the crater, causing the back end of the, uh, of the rocket motor to, to uh, twist forward just like a pole vaulter. You imagine a pole vaulter taking a, a, um, uh, a pole and placing it into the ground and then using their forward momentum to launch themselves over a, over a barrier. And th- and this is why the rocket motor, the casing is twisted, because the force of torque is so high from the impact. And so we explain everything from the computer calculations. So uh, there's there's no question that this was formed by um, um, an artillery rocket, it just was indigenous. So all this other stuff. Now, if it if it wasn't instead, as claimed by. Uh, Mr. Higgins and actually the UN um, uh, from a bomb that failed to detonate as it should have, because if it was a chemical bomb, it should have detonated above the ground. There should be a an explosive charge inside the middle of a of a drum-like bomb that would cause the container to burst. Well, it obviously, if if it would have had to fail. Uh, to burst at a height above the ground where the maximum efficiency of chemical dispersion occurs. But if it hit the ground, it would have meant that the the fuse caused it to fail. I mean, caused it to not detonate above the ground. That can happen. But if that happened, then you would see large pieces of metal associated with a container. Right. Associated with with the bomb. In other words, because it would have just crashed, not exploded. There would have well, been more wreckage. It might have, there, there might have been an explosion from the central charge, but the explosion would have just sort of dispersed the the casing. It wouldn't. It wouldn't have shattered the casing. So, um, so you would you would see strips of metal on the ground. You'd see the front and back plate of the um, of the bomb. You'd see the tail fin of the bomb. All of these would be prominently on the ground. And there might be a, a little bit of a crater, but uh, it wouldn't be as dramatic and as well shaped as this particular crater that we see from formed by the explosion. Mm-hmm. In but other words, so, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, but this is kind of a long way of saying that that crater in the road where they say it was where the sarin bomb went off was already there and was from plain old conventional artillery. And so the gas cloud came from somewhere else. Well, it's not clear that there was a gas cloud at that location because the wind direction, if you look at where the casualties were supposed to have occurred, the wind was going uh, to the east at the time that this crater was supposed to be formed. The area of casualties was to the south. So someone needs to explain why the wind somehow was moving south and, and caused the casualties in this area to the south. There was also uh, evidence of tampering uh, 
with regard to the, a, a dead goat. I don't, uh, there was a dead goat that was somewhat to the south and to the west of the crater, maybe 50 or 80 or 100 meters. And when you look at this dead goat, it certainly has the appearance of an animal that died from sarin poisoning or something very similar. There, there's no question when you look at the foaming at the mouth of this goat and its nostrils. On the other hand, in fact, the, the UN claims, and I believe that this is probably correct, that hair they were given from a goat, which could have been this goat, we have no knowledge of the chain of custody, but let's assume, let me just be uh, agnostic and assume that the hair was from this goat, showed uh, evidence of sarin on the hair of the goat. The problem is when you look at the goat carcass, it was dragged to that location. You can see drag marks behind the goat. The goat would have dropped in its place. It wouldn't have dragged itself. It was, it, you know, it, it wouldn't have drag marks behind it. <clears throat> so that's consistent. And this is a speculation, I, right? You know, that's consistent with the goat being poisoned someplace. You know, if, if you have a small amount of sarin, and you put this goat in the room with it, you can kill the goat and then drag its body over near to the, near this um, the crater and claim that it was killed by fumes from the crater. You could do the same with birds and things, where they, they, they just line sarin on the feathers of birds. Mm-hmm. So um, there's no reason to believe that this wasn't staged. It all appears to be claims made that don't, it together, except when you assume that the whole thing was made up. Hey guys, check out this cool near future dystopia, Kesslin Runs, by our friend Charles Featherstone. Uh, you might remember him, a regular writer for LouRockwell.com. And uh, this is a great story of, uh, well, I don't want to ruin it for you, but you'll really like it. Kesslin Runs, it's on Amazon.com by the great Charles Featherstone. Well, I know there and, isn't it correct that the UN had it that some people were showing up at the hospital complaining of the gas attack before it had even supposedly happened on the timeline. Well, I you know th- these these reports are very hard to know know what to make of them. I mean, I if you, I can talk about other sources of information that I don't claim to be party to. Sure, and I, I think they may be right. But, but you severely uh, doubt that there was even a, a gas poison attack there that day at all at this point. Well, I think people may well have been injured from toxic substances, and I do not even rule out that some of those substances were sarin or sarin-like. Uh, so I'm not saying it did. I'm saying it did not happen at that crater. It did not happen as claimed Mm -hmm. by the U.N. and Mr. Higgins. Now, there is an alternative. There's an alternative story on this um, that is plausible. I don't I'm not saying it's true. I don't know. But um, uh, Seymour Hirsch reported that there was that the purpose of the attack was to kill um, extremists who were having a meeting in a in a room in Khan Sheikhoun in, in the city. And the particular room was in a building where it was on the second floor of a building where the first floor uh, held a um, um, a um, uh, sorry uh, uh, a, a uh, agricultural supply store. So you had the second floor a room where a meeting was occurring in the first floor, an agricultural su- supply store. What Hirsch reports from his people, so I, I'm saying this is not me, this is Hirsch, Seymour Hirsch. Uh, what he reports is that um, the intelligence people, which in this case was Russian intelligence, which had identified the meeting time and location, <clears throat> had told the American intelligence that they were going to have the Syrian government kill these people with a bomb. And they warned the CIA so that if the CIA had an agent that already penetrated, had also penetrated 
the leadership that they would get their people, that their people would not be at this meeting. And they also had determined that the basement of this agricultural supply store uh, had, um, uh, had was an ammunition dump for the rebels. So it was not only for agricultural supplies, but there was a, it was an ammunition dump. And so there was apparently, according to what Hirsch was told, uh, a discussion between the American and Russian intelligence about uh, whether or not to proceed with such an attack because the expectation was a single bomb that would kill everybody in this room could set off this ammunition dump. And there was concern about that. But then there was basic agreement between the two parties to proceed. Now, when the, the attack occurred, no one could have known this in, uh, before the attack. It was an extremely um, gentle wind on that day. There was almost no wind at all. And so when the uh, building was hit, they not only killed everybody in the room, they set off this ammunition dump. And there were secondary explosions and fires. Now, since there was almost no wind, you had this gigantic cloud of very toxic materials, which may or may not have included sarin. We, we, we just don't know because we don't know what was stored in that ammunition dump. And, um, and this uh, big cloud would have been hundreds of meters on a side, and it would not have been moving because the wind is going to not move it off. And this particular area was surrounded by housing. So probably there were people who were poisoned and, and subjected to, um, to, to toxic uh, ingestion and, and poison, and, prob and probably there were people who were killed by it. And certainly there were other people who were not killed but injured, severely injured. So... Uh, this uh, particular story fits everything that we've observed. I'm not saying it's correct or not. I can't, I can't verify that, but that's what, what Hirsch has reported, and he has a pretty good record of being right on these things. Mm -hmm. so, um, and it fits everything that we, we looked at because the wind, we, we, did, we looked at the weather very carefully, and uh, if, if, in fact, <clears throat> what Hirsch reported is correct, the weather condition was perfect for this kind of uh, unintended uh, uh, loss of life or, or injuries from secondary effects from the attack. So if anyone's to be blamed for the attack, it's really the Americans and the, uh, and the Russians, both of whom seem to have agreed that it was important enough to uh, get this uh, group of extremists and it's hard to know. I wouldn't necessarily say blame. Blame is, uh, is a strong word because this is a war. And in war, there are always anyone who thinks you fight a war without unintended uh, victims is, is, is fooling themselves. So, uh, you know, it's anybody's guess whether this was the right choice or not. But it certainly was not the Syrian government. Uh, executing a, 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 a nerve agent attack. That That is for sure. Well, uh, I have to say that uh, Hirsch's story was later confirming and, of course, adding detail to what, on this show, we heard from Phil Giraldi, former CIA officer, that day, April the 4th, 2017, he came on this show and said CIA and military sources say that the Russians did this, that they gave the Americans a head up, uh, heads up, and, and full awareness. They'd been um, kind of uh, surveilling the place for weeks, and everybody knew this was going to happen. And they had on the deconfliction line, they had told the Americans, okay, we're going to go ahead and hit that building now. And everybody knew that that was what had happened and that whatever, you know, gas had come out was as a result of that. And so we heard that that day. So when Hirsch came out, yeah, well, I wasn't he was aware of this. So this is interesting to me that you you had already heard this too. Yep. Um, so I came at this knowing nothing. Yep. And that was military and intelligence sources from right away on that as well. And uh, people are welcome to check the archives at scotthorton.org. In fact, I'm going to interview Phil Giraldi later today and maybe talk about that a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. But I'd listen, appreciate it. if you could send me a link to that, I'd be very interested to hear that. Uh, yes, I'm making a note right now. 
Um, yes, please do, because uh, this would be very interesting to me. Okay, great. Um, now, I got to talk to you before you go. Uh, I hope you have some time uh, to talk about this incredible piece that you wrote for the New York Times. I really learned something here about the anti-missile missiles. And I guess I thought the whole controversy with Bush and then the Obama program, which had changed it somewhat, but the basic theory was we're going to put anti-missile missiles in Poland and radars in the Czech Republic, and it was all going to be in the name of protecting Poland from Iran somehow, um, but that this was some kind of threat against the Russians, obviously, um, to uh, you know basically help to enable a possible nuclear first strike by nullifying their retaliatory capability against us. However, I apparently got that all kind of twisted, and it's worse than that um, and different than that. And uh, you explain in this article in the context now of Trump withdrawing the United States from the INF, uh, which is the Intermediate Nuclear Forces uh, Treaty, which uh, in the I, I think the Bush senior years had taken American missiles and and Russian missiles out of Europe. Yeah, the, basically, there is this uh, really valuable treaty known as the INF Treaty. INF standing uh, uh, standing an acronym for Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which was uh, basically negotiated around 1987. And it uh, resulted in both Russia and the United States uh, not deploying certain kinds of missiles that would threaten the other, that would result in extremely short warning and uh, short warning attacks, in fact, attacks that might not even give any warning because of the proximity of the weapons and the difficulties in detecting their launches. And this was a very good thing because if you have a crisis, you don't want one side or the other to start launching nuclear forces because they think they're under attack. Most people who worry about uh, accidental nuclear war, and this is an area that I've done a lot of work in, worry about, uh, they don't worry about someone rationally making a decision to use nuclear weapons, although that could happen. Improbable in my view, but you can't rule it out. You worry about circumstances that cause people to make a very bad decision that escalates quickly out of control. And in a crisis where both sides are very nervous and you can't tell if the other side is in, you know, and both sides have weapons, <clears throat> where it's hard for the other to detect preparations to launch or even knowledge of launch before all of a sudden things start happening, uh, there's there's a chance which there's a chance that somebody could think they're under attack and start launching weapons in order to prevent them from being lost. One hopes that this will never occur, but if it does occur, it could escalate into a very large exchange of nuclear weapons. And the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty was a was an important and very effective step away from allowing these kinds of forces to be deployed on European soil. The, there's still problems of accidental war, but the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty did help a lot in reducing uh, the level of tension and uh, and and diminishing the the possible ways that such a, a catastrophe could be initiated. And now, um, what really happened, uh, people don't want to talk about this because people, they want to blame, uh, you know, the other side, in this case, Trump versus the Democrats, for all of the problems. Now, there's no question that Mr. Trump is being totally reckless in this situation. So I don't want there to be any ambiguity about my views on this. But uh, the fact of the matter is that this, the conditions set up for this current situation were set up by uh, the Obama administration. The Obama administration was concerned about uh, a, a situation set up by George W. Bush, uh, which was called the European uh, uh, Defense Initiative. 
And what the Bush administration, what the George W. Bush administration wanted to do was place large missile defense interceptors in Poland. These were the same kinds of interceptors that are now deployed in Alaska. So these are big interceptors. They look like ICBMs. They're as big as Minutemen ICBMs. And they wanted to put 10 of them in Poland. And uh, and a second site, the, the, the argument was it would be a second missile defense site to be able to to intercept uh, Iranian long-range missiles that could be launched at the United States. Of course, these missiles have never emerged, so that's, there's another discussion about threat inflation there. Uh, but uh, So Obama inherited this bad decision by the George W. Bush administration, and it looks like he was looking for a way to uh, uh, to placate the Russians, who were very much against this. And I think the Russian concerns were valid in, the, in this particular case. So, um, unfortunately, it seems to me, in fact, I'm sure at this point, that Obama's uh, advisors did not do a good job. They did not give him correct technical information about this decision. And he inadvertently decided to deploy the, the system called the European Phased Adaptive Approach that had two characteristics that are remarkably bad for future stability with Russia. The first was the, the system had no missile defense capability against uh, long-range Iranian missiles. Uh, remarkable. And, uh, and somebody ought to say, who was involved in this? You can't just only blame Obama. you got to blame his staff. And um, in any case, the radars were not powerful enough to see warheads at long enough range for relatively slow interceptors associated with this kind of system to get to intercept points. So it could just be overflown. It would just be overflown without the ability to intercept um, Iranian missiles. And so it was a system that was pointless, that had no defense capability. The second problem was the... Um, the land-based component of it, which were to be sites that were going to be deployed in Poland and Romania, those sites were being used simply for political reasons, to placate different countries, in particular Poland and Romania, with regard to promises that were made earlier by the Bush administration. So they were going to put these sites in Poland and Romania and the sites had the ability to launch offensive cruise missiles. And those cruise missiles were, were in violation of, of the INF Treaty. So the Russians immediately raised concerns about this. So um, I talked to uh, Sergei Rogoff of the Institute for the Study of Canada and the USA, and he told me that uh, Mike McFall who was a principal advisor to Obama, uh, that he told Mike McFaul in 2009 that this was a violation of the INF Treaty. Uh, I happened to be uh, living around Stanford uh, part of the time, and I've been trying to get Mike McFaul to explain to me what happened, but he, don't, he won't talk to me. So my assumption is McFaul screwed up along with his buddy. They didn't provide the appropriate technical input to the president before he made this decision. I don't know that's true. It just, just looks that way to me. Okay, so... So, but, uh, I'm sorry? I'm, I'm a little confused because I thought that the whole point of the Aegis radar was to enable anti-missile missiles. But you're saying that this Aegis Couldn't, radar system here was not. It can't do the job. It, this is not to be... You should not assume that the Aegis system isn't an extremely capable anti-aircraft defense because aircraft have very large radar cross-sections, radar reflectivity, relative to ballistic missile warheads. Uh, a radar reflective, a radar cross-section of an airplane, of a combat airplane, might be uh, a significant fraction of a square meter. Think of it as a, an effective reflecting area. A warhead 
could be one thousandth of a square meter, a thousand times smaller. The warhead is moving at uh, five or six or seven kilometers per second. The airplane is moving at 300 meters per second. So it's moving more slowly. It's also at ranges of tens of kilometers, while the warhead could be at ranges of many hundreds of kilometers. So the radar, which is tremendously powerful in terms of dealing, you know, of tracking and engaging aircraft, it is unable to do anything against this very small radar cross-section object that's traveling at very high speeds at very far distances. Okay. And now, so but as far radar, as... Radar, I'm sorry? So, but then when it comes to the cruise missiles, how is it that the Aegis radar helps to <clears throat> enable a possible cruise missiles there, which obviously a Tomahawk could be a nuke or a conventional bomb, right? No, the Aegis radar is irrelevant. The problem is the Aegis radar is... Uh, the Aegis... Uh, the Aegis missile defense system that's on the on the ground called Aegis Ashore. Mm -hmm. The Aegis Ashore system consists of a radar and then a very uh, elaborate uh, missile control system, missile a system for carrying missiles and firing to missiles, and that's known as the Mark Forty One vertical launch system. It's just a a set of canisters that are designed to hold missiles in them and to launch missiles. So that's, that's, the, that's the sword side of the Aegis system, is right. the ability to launch the missiles. Okay, now, so the to Aegis red team this a little bit, if, if you sorry? and I are on Vladimir Putin's staff or we're members of the Russian military, we're looking at this and, and we're saying, uh, yeah, uh, Mr. President, the thing is here is the installation that they're putting in, it can't be used for what they say it's for. It can be used for targeting us with extremely fast, very short notice giving cruise missiles that could be you, armed you got, with H-bombs. I'm sorry? So, so the Russians, you're right. So the Russians look at this and they say the Americans are claiming it's a missile defense. It clearly can't work. Doesn't work that way. It can't work that way. Uh, but it can be used uh, for offensive launch to launch offensive missiles against Russia. And those missiles happen to be non-compliant with the INF treaty. So the Russians say, "What's going on here?" I mean, I was an advisor to the chief of naval operations. If the Russians did this, I would say they're in violation of the treaty. That would have been my advice to the to the chief of naval operations. They say they're in violation of the treaty. They got to stop this. And now, but in our case, we don't want to acknowledge it. I mean, it's un, it's believable to me that Obama doesn't understand this because Lord knows what Obama understands, and yet this has to be delivered by somebody. Well, um, it, is it just no, armed salesmen, I, 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 or is there really think, a strategy I, behind I think, this, or not? I, I think it's possible. First of all, I don't think it's possible that it, it, it was intentional on the part of some people. And it's also possible it was just short-sightedness and uh, the, political, uh, the, the political parameters taking over relative to the, um, uh, <clears throat> to the realities that would be understood by more technically informed people. It was certainly a gigantic... Uh, a gigantic screw up. And I would, I mean, I'm furious with this Obama, these Obama staff people who were supporting him during this decision. I was in a role when I was in the Pentagon of, of supporting the chief of naval operations in similar decisions. And I took my job very seriously. I didn't, I didn't necessarily agree with what the decision was but it was my job to make sure that everybody understood what the potential consequences of the decision was. And my guess is Obama didn't know because his staff didn't tell him. And, did it, did it, and the reason his staff didn't tell him was probably because some of the staff didn't know and they did not do their homework and check. So if not knowing is not an excuse. Doing your homework or not doing your homework is also not an excuse. 
But there were also people who should have known who, uh, who didn't tell them. For example, Ash Carter, uh, the Secretary of Defense mm-hmm. uh, under, in, the, in the later last two years of the Obama administration, at the time of the earlier decision, was the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition, Technology, and Logistics. Carter would have had the responsibility for looking into the technical issues and informing the president about this problem. He obviously either didn't do his homework or didn't know or didn't have the situation properly looked at. So he's responsible for the mistake as well as other people on Obama's staff. Now, did Carter know that this was a problem and not say anything? I think it's possible because Carter was willing to undermine the president's attempts to uh, to have a peace treaty, uh, you know, a peace arrangement in Syria right. uh, that was negotiated between Lavrov and, and, and Kerry. As well, he's a real wonk from inside the Pentagon, not just some political appointee type hack. So he well, would have... I mean, I know Carter very well. We used to be friends. We're not friends now, but we used to be friends. And I, he is smart. And he is smart enough to know, I, I'm not the, I don't like his views and his, his, his ethical standards, but he's smart enough to know exactly that this would have been a problem. Mm-hmm. So the question is, did he knowingly do this? All right, I now one know. last thing here on the, on the INF Treaty. We're out now, and it's not because the Russians called out Obama for violating it. They tolerated that violation politely, and yet the accusation is they developed some mid-range missiles um, I think even critics of the decision to leave the treaty um, are saying that apparently, possibly, they really did develop some mid-range missiles, but even then they're pointing them at the Chinese. Um, and actually, I talked with Chas Freeman on the show, um, and the former diplomat and intelligence official, yeah. and, and he was saying that really the real reason America wants out of this treaty isn't even about Russia. They know that Russia's... Uh, somewhat pseudo mid-range missiles, at least, are for China, not America. But America wants to deploy mid-range missiles against China as well in the Pacific. And so that's why we're sacrificing this, essentially, this incredibly important Reagan-era peace treaty with the Russians um, in order to get at the Chinese. And uh, so I wonder what you think of that. And I wonder what you think of the Russian missiles. Were they really in violation? And if so, what should have been done about that? All these kinds of things. Well, I, I have no idea if the Russian missiles are in violation. But I do have very serious doubts about the intelligence claims. I want to be clear here. I'm not saying the intelligence claims are false. I'm saying I don't know whether or not they're true. And the reason I, uh, I'm, I've watched intelligence claims in the past, and I know for a fact that the intelligence claims that were absolutely unambiguously true turned out not to be true. And it's not, and in my case, it's not simply the weapons of mass destruction under the Bush administration. It has to do with the intelligence after the Damascus sarin attack that the Obama White House claimed to have released, that intelligence was totally false. There was no way that they had evidence that the Syrian government, as they claimed, was the source of that sarin attack. Because I, I, and I wrote extensively about that. The rockets that were used for that sarin attack could not possibly have flown from Syrian government-controlled territory. And... We proved it, and the U.N. agreed with that. The rockets were too short-range because they were carrying. They had this big barrel of sarin on the front end, and they only had a two-kilometer range, and they would have had to have a 20-kilometer range for them to be flown as claimed by the Obama White House. And that tells me something was very wrong with the intelligence. And I still have the videos of John Kerry swearing in front of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee that our intelligence was absolutely right. And they had checked it and rechecked it. This is his statement. We had checked it and rechecked it because we are sensitive to what happened 
in the in in the uh, in the Bush administration where the intelligence was wrong. Yeah. And here, well, he hey, is. we're having this conversation just two days after Mueller finally admitted after two years that there never was anything to Brennan and Clapper's claims about Trump and Russia either. Well, so. we we just don't know. I don't. I'm not saying the intelligence is wrong. I'm just saying the emphasis that we know and the intel and the claims of the intelligence community are uh, mean nothing to me. Right, now, let's say and, though, and because you are an expert in a lot of areas about this, I know you're not necessarily a diplomat, but if if it was true, if if the intel was true, and you were impressed that hey, it looks like the Russians are skating the line on this treaty, what do you think should be done? Uh, let them just take advantage of us, Ted? No, I would say I would say they're in violation of the treaty. We need to confront them. Incidentally, we're in violation of the treaty. Treaties are important. Uh, treaties should be followed to the letter of the law. You can't allow treaty. You, you can't just sort of let each side whittle away at the legality and the legal, the language and intent of the treaty. Both sides have to follow the treaty, you know, to, to the letter of the treaty. So we need to address the Russian concerns about the, the Aegis Ashore, and they need to address our concerns about the range of this missile. And so that would be my position. And uh, so I would. So when the Russians offer, as they did on, I think it was January five, is the is the date I recall, to allow us to intrusively and transparently inspect this uh, uh, this missile, but but in ex- in exchange they need to be able to inspect the Aegis Ashore system. I would say both sides have a right to those inspections. We need to go through the inspections. We need to negotiate the differences. And maybe if we have, if we find there are problems on both ends, then we need to come up with some understanding that's mutually acceptable to allow these treaties to stay in place. Because the benefits to each side, the, the strike benefit of the Aegis Ashore is really not militarily significant, nor is the possibility that this missile that the Russians have might be might have a range somewhat longer than 500 kilometers. I don't know. I, I don't know it's more than 500 kilometers, but if there's an issue, we need to get that resolved. And and the treaty needs to be followed. Both sides need to absolutely let the other side determine to to a reasonable satisfaction that either. Both sides are within the bounds of the treaty, or there needs to be some negotiated, mutually acceptable understanding about this this non uh, non compliant uh, situation on both sides. But so I so I would be for negotiating. There's nothing n- nothing in either non compliance claim is significant enough militarily to justify losing this treaty. The loss of this treaty will be far more dangerous to both sides than some marginal military issues that could come up from these non-compliant arrangements. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying I, I think they need to be addressed. So right. I'm not saying ignore them, but I'm saying that it's not worth losing the treaty over it. Right. And the idea that you can't perform certain military missions because you don't have these kinds of weapons is totally ridiculous. We have. We have ballistic missiles on submarines that can, can, can deliver nuclear warheads to any range we choose. And you don't need thousands of warheads, uh, you know, on thousands of other additional kinds of delivery systems. There is really no military contingency that you can, that's real that you can come up with that can't be addressed with, the, with, the, with, the, with, with weapons that already exist in the United States, in Russia, and in China. So let's forget about losing this treaty over some imagined advantage you would have because you can have cruise missiles of 600 to 1,000 kilometers range. This is just totally ridiculous when you look at the military, you know, the way, the way military forces can be delivered, can right. be utilized these days. The flexibility is just so high that uh, this is not a problem.
All right, you guys, that's Ted Postal. He is Professor Emeritus of Science, Technology, and International Security at MIT. Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Please send me that uh, URL to the uh, earlier discussion. Will do. I already found it, and actually I accidentally lied. It was two days later, April the 6th. It doesn't matter. But Don't it's worry. on its yeah. way there. And uh, I, I everybody, the article it. at the New York Times, this extremely important piece, is called Are Trump and Putin Opening Pandora's Box? Thanks again, Ted. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All right, y'all. Thanks. Find me at libertarianinstitute.org at scotthorton.org, antiwar.com, and reddit.com slash scotthortonshow. Oh, yeah, and read my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan, at foolserrand.us.